I am in northwest Mexico, in an inhospitable land which for many centuries has been the home of the Tarahumara Indians, a very hospitable tribe. Their ancestors came from Asia, crossing the Bering Straits. I came here on the back of a mule, the best way of traveling across the Sierra Madre. The family is very important to them, as it constitutes the social base that ensures their precarious well-being. They are strong people, accustomed to living with very little, and who value people more than things. The man with the most experience in the village is the chief, or Siriyame, and he is chosen by a system of showing of hands which makes vote rigging impossible. On Sundays, he gives them a chat, and they go to see him to resolve the problems of the community. Like their ancestors, they grow maize. They don't have many resources, but they do have their own philosophy. They never tell their children off. They give them responsibilities from when they are very young, and they teach them to decide for themselves. Maize and some animals. They suffer from illnesses due to scarcity, but despite his appearance, this child is receiving treatment, as the village doctor, an affable man called Cherokee, tells me. The Raramuri marry very young, from the age of 16, and the woman calls all her children the same, Danala. Raramuri means the light-footed ones. They have always liked running, and they still do. That is why the men play rarajipo. The game consists of kicking the ball with the inside of the foot along a course. With the inside of the foot, they kick the ball, which in their language is called the komakali. Each team supports its favorite, and they follow him throughout the race, bringing water, food, and enthusiasm. The teams bet, and the winner is the one who reaches the finish, which may be one or two hundred kilometers away, so the race can last for days. But that is absolutely no problem for the Lightfoot Indians. I too must dash. There are several ways you can get to the island of Madagascar by boat, plane, or on a floating trunk. Of the 135 species of chameleon that exist in the world, half live in Madagascar. It is possible that they were the inspiration for Golem, the slimy inhabitant of the swamps in The Lord of the Rings. The chameleon is a lizard that loves climbing up trees. That is why they are perfectly at home in forests and jungles. Their prehensile tails help them to move along the treetops, and they are capable of remaining completely immobile if they want to go unnoticed. Their toes have fused together to form just two opposable ones, which enables them to climb up and cling onto the trunks without any problem whatsoever. In addition, it is a camouflaged hunter, capable of remaining completely immobile, then quickly flicking out its sticky tongue at unsuspecting victims. This grasshopper didn't even know what hit it.
two male Parsons chameleons have coincided on the same branch. As they don't have nails and their teeth are not exactly fearsome, they use their nasal appendages to sort things out. Though this nose fight doesn't have serious consequences. A bit of pushing and shoving, a short struggle. And one of them suddenly finds himself on the ground. They come in all sizes to suit all tastes. The chameleon's famous ability to change color is due to physiological and psychological causes. They can change as the temperature varies, from night to day, and also if they're furious or if they detect a female willing to keep them company. From Madagascar to Australia, this island is larger than the previous one. The moas were enormous birds that lived in old Gondwana. The emu and the cassowary are descendants of the moas. The moas were the ancestors of the African ostrich and the South American rheas. That is why its face is pretty similar to that of the ostrich, because they're relatives, distant relatives, but relatives nonetheless. The female emu lays her eggs on the ground, on a bed of leaves. Then she forgets about them, and it is the male that incubates them all by himself. However, both parents do take responsibility for looking after their young, and the young emus enjoy being taken care of by both parents. Compared to the rest of the many different species that inhabit these jungles, the cassowaries are rather tall birds, measuring two meters and weighing around 60 kilos. Of course, they can't fly, but they can majestically strut around like elegant descendants of the moas and the extinct elephant bird, a bird that measured four meters and weighed half a ton. The cassowaries are solitary birds. I make sure I don't get too close, as their reactions are unpredictable and they could even attack you. And that protuberance called the cask that they have on their heads accentuates the air of menace. Despite its appearance, it is a relatively recent bird as it has only been with us for about 10,000 years. And from here to a rather scaly place. The River Sepik, almost 1,000 kilometers long, runs through northern New Guinea. In its final stretch, the deep brown-colored waters pour into the Bismarck Sea and contain both mud and crocodiles. This building is a house tambaran, 
and they normally stand in the center of the village safe from the river flooding. The decorations and drawings represent gods, prophecies, and everyday scenes. And this is a crocodile. I might be wrong, but it seems to me that there is a certain similarity. The tambaran is made of bamboo and palm leaves, also called the boathouse. It is the home of the spirits and the life of the village revolves around it. Yes, it's true. Its form does remind us of the crocodiles in the river Sepik. Inside the tambaran, the men invoke the spirits by means of magic and ritual music. Today is a special day, Saint Alligator perhaps? They have put on their finest clothes, the traditional costume to invoke their gods. The tambaran is exclusive to men. Women and the uninitiated are not allowed in. dance and invoke their protector gods. From inside, the flutes and the tam-tam sound out, indicating to those outside what they must do. A place where they worship the man-eater, the sepic crocodile, which they believe was the creator of the sky and the earth. Farewell to the crocodiles, and now it's off to the land of Shala. In northern Kenya, in the Shaba Reserve, lives a very peculiar species of bird, the secretary bird. Despite their appearance, they are birds of prey and very specialized hunters. There is very little rain in Shaba, but when it reappears, the savanna immediately recovers. The yellow quickly turns to green, and there are a lot of things to be done, gathering material and preparing the home for starters. These elegant birds build their nest using branches they collect. Though they both work, collection is above all the responsibility of the male. He collects and transports them, and she very carefully puts them in place. It's the mating season, and the male and female treat each other with delicacy, courting and eventually seducing each other. At the top of an acacia, they build their enormous nest. This they do in full view, but they are rather more modest when it comes to sex, and no one has ever seen them mate. What we do know is that they lay no more than three eggs, if all three survive, there will be a large secretary family. And in order to take care of their family, they have to eat well. Nothing better than hunting insects together. But like the birds of prey they are, they also appreciate the odd little feline or unsuspecting rodent. This feathery skater knows very well what he's looking for. The savanna is a true larder. great vigor, the beak goes into action. There's space for everyone. The kite is a cousin of the secretary birds, a short but strong relative who requires no invitation to join in the meal. These 
are the highlands of the Sulawesi, the home of the former headhunters, the Toroja, which means men of the mountains. I have come to the village of Kete on the day of the funeral of a nobleman. After three months during which he has remained embalmed, everything is ready. The deceased Mayana was a pung, an important figure in the village. No expenses spared in the funeral, which will mean virtual financial ruin for his family. The luxury of the ceremony ensures the return of the dead man to the paradise of his ancestors. It's all a question of keeping the deceased happy. If Mayana is satisfied with his funeral, he will protect his family and bring them good luck. At first, the living do not cry over the dead. This is more like a rather rowdy party. In the midst of this tumult, they raise up the coffin with a great deal of commotion. But with the bang of the gong, the ceremony changes. They now show their sadness. I don't know whether for the loss of Mayana or for the financial ruin his funeral has meant for them. To pay for this very expensive ceremony, they have all had to sell rice patties and animals. The pigs are carried through the air. But everyone is waiting for the star event, the buffalo fight. In this funeral dance called the Mabadong, the men sing and dance holding on to each other by their little fingers in a singular circle of lamentations. As with all good wakes, food plays an important part. They need to regain their strength because the hardest part of the funeral is yet to come, carrying the deceased up to the sacred rocks of Randempao in the jungle. When they die, the men of the mountain return to it. As they put the coffin in the tomb, the officiant reads out a prayer for the dead. The local artisan makes the Tao Tao of Mayana, a wooden sculpture depicting the deceased. This carving costs the family five buffaloes, a fortune. Once the figure has been completed, it joins the balcony of the other world from where the deceased observe them in a rather disturbing manner. I leave this sinister balcony behind and only just manage to catch my flight. In the central part of India, there are three large national parks, Shivpuri, Bandhavgar, and Kana. These mountains and the forests that surround them are home to the richest wildlife in the country. I have come to the Kanha National Park. Here there are different types of jungles and forests and in them very varied and very lively fauna. The langurs love the leaves and the fruits of the trees. Like the primates that they are, these monkeys live in groups, all together, males, females and young. The family of the Langurs does not live alone. The chittal is the most abundant herbivore in these parks, and like all good herbivores, they live in herds.
They form the basis of the diet of the large carnivores, especially the tiger. That is why they must always remain on the alert. The langurs and the chittles get on well together. The monkeys, who can be rather fussy eaters, take a couple of mouthfuls, taste it, and then throw it to the ground. For the chittles, these fruits and berries are manna from heaven. As well as providing them with a variety of fruit, the langurs are also magnificent lookouts. If a leopard, tiger, or jackal approaches, the sentries up in the branches immediately sound the alarm. There are plenty of young because the female shittles give birth frequently, once every six months, and they happily play together. A harmonious relationship between two very different species, sharing the forest that created them. <laughs>